Hey, it's Tim, and welcome back to another episode of Wrong Sports. I am going to be doing another deep dive this time where I'm going to be going into long streaks in college sports. In my first episode, I went over the longest losing streak in Division II football. And then in my next deep dive, I went on a two-parter where I got into what was then known as the longest losing streak in Division I football at the time from Columbia football in the mid-1980s. But in this new episode, I'm going to be covering what is now the longest losing streak in college football. It's a losing streak that will probably never get beaten because it is the Prairie View A&M football losing streak of the 1990s. But before I get into this deep dive for Prairie View, make sure you like this video, make sure you share this video, and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to the channel, please. Uh, also, make sure you leave me a comment, tell me what other losing streaks or winning streaks that you want me to cover, because I will be covering winning streaks uh, very soon as I get into the summer. And as always, make sure you check me out on Twitter at Sports Wronged. And I'm just going to give you a little short summary, a little history lesson about Prairie View A&M. First off, Prairie View is located in Prairie View, Texas. It's about 40 miles west of Houston. And Prairie View A&M is also the second oldest public institution of higher learning in Texas. It was established in 1876. And it was also put in the state's constitution as a school for African Americans. The school is an A&M school, and it also means that the ROTC is pretty big on campus, and they have trained upwards of 200 officers up to that time in the early 1990s. Along with being known for that, they also have a very good nursing school and a very good engineering school. But to go with the education side, the school became one of the more well-known historical black colleges slash universities, along with Grambling and Southern back in the day, due to their football team and their coach, Billy Nix. Under Knicks from 1952 to 1965, they won 127 games and they had three undefeated seasons as well as six black college national championships. Along with that, they also have one of the best bands in the country and you will be seeing a lot of video of them. Like I mentioned, they are called Marching Storm and they would be the ones who would actually draw more spectators and more attention than any of the sports on campus. And that's probably why I can find more video on the bands than I can on the football team. Anyway though, Prairie View A&M was a great team in the 1950s and 60s, but once the 1970s came, they struggled as they had one winning record in the 1970s and in the 1980s, they could barely get to three wins a season. They went through coaches every three or four years, and instead of looking for a new face to shake things up, they kept hiring from within or promoting their coordinators to head coach. Example being Conway Heyman. He got the job in 1983, but after an 0-3-1 start in 1987, he was fired and Prairie View A&M promoted their offensive coordinator, Hanny Ketchings, to head coach. Ketchings never had a head coaching job before this, and he finished off the 1987 with a 3-4 record. And he improved to 5-5 five five in 1988, the first time they had a 500 record or better in over a decade. But after that 5-5 five five record, the team completely fell apart, and they went 1-9 in 1989. But during that season, there was tons of turmoil, as players boycotted playing, and dozens of players left the team, some even joining the Army so that they wouldn't have to play on the team. The reason was because Ketching, who apparently took athletics more seriously than academics, to the point that half of his team were in some sort of academic trouble. But it wasn't because the players were dumb. It was because Ketchings was like a mini emperor on campus, as he would threaten players that weren't playing well on the field with taking away their financial aid, which for most players was the only way they could actually go to school. Plus, Ketchings would have six hour long practices, resulting in exhausting his players and not allowing them to get their schoolwork done. And along with that, there were also other accusations of Ketchings taking books away from players that weren't performing well on the field, also making them suffer academically. This would all come to a head towards the end of 1989, as Prairie View was 0-7. They would beat Mississippi Valley State in Game 8, and then lose their next game by 1, before losing their finale by 49 points, making them 1-9. So it was clear that something was wrong, but the president of the university still didn't want to let Ketchings go. Ketchings would hang on through 1989 and actually into the spring, but after uncovering a massive financial scandal, Ketchings was found to have forged or lied on financial forms, and he was finally let go, along with about 8 to 10 other coaches on campus. 
The financial scandal not only affected football, but all sports, as the school would shut down all of the athletic teams besides track and field for the 1990 season. The football team and the other teams would be back in 1991, but under massive financial handicaps due to being $3 million in debt, and because only a fraction of the alumni came through to donate, so they really didn't have any good funding. And because of that, the athletic department hired or promoted people already on campus. Their women's track and field coach would be the athletic director, along with her coaching job. And to find the next football coach, she didn't look far, promoting their defense defensive coordinator Ronald Beard to be the head coach and he would also assist her in the athletic department as well as other jobs which I'll get to in just a moment. So after hearing all the craziness that was happening to the athletic department it wouldn't be shocking that they would go on an epic losing streak but fans of the program and former players just didn't know how bad it was going to be. So now we are finally in 1991, and I just mentioned how Ronald Beard was hired to coach, turn around, and pretty much remake the Prairie View A&M team, but it wasn't going to be easy at all. As along with coaching and assisting the athletic department, Beard was also teaching 28 hours of classes each week, and he coached the golf team as well. But you might be thinking, okay, he has assistants, right? Yeah, he did have four full-time assistant coaches, and I'm going to be putting quotes around full-time because these coaches weren't just coaching football, example being their offensive backs coach, Clifton Gillard. He was also an assistant on the track and field team, plus their defensive line coach was the tennis coach on campus, and their defensive backs coach was the women's basketball coach. So this was really a high school coaching staff on a shoestring budget, coaching Division I AA football. Well, if the coaching staff didn't look great, their roster really didn't either, as they only had five defensive players returning from 1989, but on offense, they were returning a quarterback who was injured through the 1989 season, so he still had eligibility remaining. They also had 20 players on their roster when the season started. This was according to the conference media guide, so this might have been players that signed or made the team through open tryouts. And they also had another 30 signees from high school. With just barely a full roster, they started the season knowing that some players would have to play both offense and defense, and if someone got injured, they might not have anyone behind them on the depth chart. Okay, so the coaches had handicaps, there were limited players, and oh yeah, their equipment was really subpar. Most of their tackling equipment was broken, so they practiced using themselves, resulting in more injuries. Plus, their jerseys weren't even theirs, as they used old practice jerseys from the Houston Oilers and on top of that they couldn't even wash them properly as their washing machine couldn't take detergents and would often break down so they washed it in just water showing off stains throughout the season plus there was also a story in Sports Illustrated about a player on their defensive line who weighed over 330 pounds and they didn't have padding for him which I'm sure was not good for him at all but they started the season with all of those minuses and Beard was thinking that his team could at least compete because in their first game versus Texas Southern, they had 200 passing yards and 249 total yards, but they gave up 400 yards in this game and they were down 20 to nothing at halftime, resulting in number one on the season, 23 to six. But even though this loss was number one of 1991, it was actually loss number three of this epic losing streak, so strap on in. Next week was the start of some really bad games for Prairie View. First, they traveled to Angelo State. They were out of the Lone Star Conference in Division II for a non-SWAC game. And this might have been their most embarrassing game since it was versus a lower level team and Prairie View had 29 yards rushing. Yes, 29 yards rushing, 18 yards passing, and four first downs. Angelo State, meanwhile, had 550 total yards, 37 first downs to cruise by Prairie View 55 to nothing. So that was a bad game, but this next game was pretty bad too because they were playing Southwestern Missouri State. They are now known as Missouri State. So this was another non-SWAC game. But this was also a 1AA team. They were out of the Missouri Valley Conference. So they were supposed to be on their level, but really Division II and Division III teams were more on Prairie View's level. And I'm always trying to find positives, which is hard for them this season, as they did better on offense in this game, which was easy to do after last game, as they had 90, yes, 90 total yards, 
but they gave up 300 yards by halftime and gave up over 400 yards total, and they got shut out again for loss number five, 61 to nothing. They just kept struggling as they played another out-of-conference team, Texas A&I, who are another D2 school out of the Lone Star Conference, but they were one of the really good teams out of that conference, and Prairie View didn't do well against one of the mediocre teams in that conference, so you can just assume how this game went as Texas A&I had 28 points in the first quarter, and once again Prairie View gave up over 400 yards, they didn't get 100 yards on offense, and they lost 41 to 3, so at least they scored some points in this game, but it could have been a lot worse because Texas A&I clearly kept their foot off the pedal in the second half. So now they're back to playing in their conference, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, with their most famous coach in the SWAC, and a coach that had over 350 wins at this time, and he was nearing 400. That was Eddie Robinson. And usually these Grambling games didn't go well, but it actually looked pretty good because Prairie View actually scored first on a halfback pass for 74 yards, but then Grambling would score eight touchdowns before the half and a few more after half to win 77 to seven. But hey, at least Prairie View would actually score first. This was actually Prairie View's worst defensive outing so far as they gave up over six Hundred yards. Yeah, Grambling did not take their foot off the pedal in this game. The 74 yard touchdown pass definitely helped with their total though, because they had over 200 yards total in this game, but they couldn't get in the end zone again, so they only had seven points, which was their highest point total for the next few weeks. They get another out of conference team next and another Division II school. This time it was the Cameron Aggies. And I don't have stats on this game, but I don't think Prairie View did all that much. They lost 51 to 6. And this game was probably one of their lowest of low points this season due to Cameron not only being a Division II school, but also because Cameron would play one more season of football in 1992 before disbanding their program completely. These next three games were like really bad. If you thought that last game was bad, these next three are like really bad in terms of just stats and just score wise. Uh, first, they traveled to Alcorn State to play a freshman that would have a great NFL career in quarterback Steve McNair. He was already showing how good he would be as he would have over 300 yards in this game and a few touchdowns, adding to his freshman record of 19 touchdowns he had through six games. Alcorn State in this game had 700 total yards, while our friends at Prairie View had 71 yards. That's it. This game was a blowout by half, and the final score was 61 to nothing. Prairie View is now 0-7 on the season, and the streak is at 9. Okay, that last game was ugly, but this next game showed just how bad Prairie View was because they would be playing Alabama State, who were 5-0-1 with their only tie against Texas Southern, who, if you remember, beat Prairie View by 40 points. So after hearing that, it wasn't going to be crazy that Prairie View A&M was going to lose, but I don't think anyone thought how bad this game was actually going to be because there was actually a big record set in this game. Alabama State scored 50 points in a quarter Order, as they put up 50 points in the second quarter to put this game completely out of hand at half. They were leading 72 to nothing at the half. Like most games happening this season with Prairie View A&M, most if not all of the fans left at halftime, which was where the best part of this game was, when the bands played obviously. And they didn't miss anything after half as Prairie View had under 100 yards in this game and they lost 92 to nothing which was the first time in about a decade or two where a team gave up 90 plus points. Okay, this next one had some significance as Prairie View A&M was playing Mississippi Valley State, who was the last team that Prairie View A&M beat in 1989. This game was hard fought for maybe the first half or so, but it was still 21 to nothing Mississippi Valley at half. Prairie View A&M had a better offensive output this game as they had over 140 total yards, but they still didn't score, losing 42 to nothing, and they are now 0-9, and in those last three games, they gave up 195 points, and they didn't score in any of those games. 
All right, so those last three games were pretty dreadful, but they would get a little bit better here coming up. Prairie View AM was actually supposed to be playing SWAC opponent Jackson State this week, but they couldn't get the schedule right, so they had to play it later in the season. So Prairie View ended up playing a non-SWAC team in Texas State. But I don't think it really would have mattered who Prairie View AM would have played because they didn't have a lot of offense in this game. And it mostly came in the second half due to Texas State playing pretty much every player on their team this game. But even with 300 yards of passing offense, Prairie View A&M could only muster six points. Texas State, meanwhile, had 680 total yards. They led 38 to nothing at half. And once again, everyone stayed for halftime for the bands to show up. And then they left when the bands left. The final score was 59 to six. But this was really the first time they scored in about 14 quarters. One more chance left for Prairie View as they would play Southern in their final game, who were coming off a four-game losing streak, and they gave up a bunch of points in every game. So maybe Prairie View could manage something here? They did actually manage some offense in this game, as they had over 300 total yards in this game. They managed to score 20 points in this game, too. The only thing was they scored all 20 points in the second half, and by that point, Southern had scored about five times or so. So the win didn't obviously come here. The final was 56 to 20, but this score looked a lot closer than it really was. Prairie View did it though. They went 0-11, making their losing streak now 13. They also had some disgusting stats in this season, as you can guess in some of the scores from these games like I mentioned. One stat that is crazy is that their rushing total for the year was 377 yards on 299 carries, meaning they averaged less than one yard a carry, and they had less than 40 yards of rushing a game. Plus, after looking at final stats, I can conclude if this team didn't have the defense that they had, they would lose every game by about 100. I say this because they didn't really have a terrible passing defense, as they finished better than one other team in their conference. Plus, they came in third in the SWAC in having the least amount of penalties. And to go along with that, they had a plus seven turnover margin. So I could just imagine if they had a negative one, how much worse the scores could have been. Checking in on their offense, there weren't many bright spots in this team. The lone one was their receiver, Bo Gillard. He led the SWAC in pass receptions, but that might be because he caught anywhere between 80 to 90% of the passes thrown by all of the quarterbacks. There were 84 caught passes this season, and he caught 68. So yeah, he was pretty much their entire offense. And one final stat before I move on to the next year, this team was outscored in the first half 393 to seven. I'm not sure if I've ever seen a contrast like that before. And it kind of proves something that I'll be mentioning and I'll be talking about a lot at the end of this video, and that is how far behind Prairie View really was from everyone, not only in Division I AA, but probably Division II or Division III. This school probably just should have taken the 1991 year off and then come back in 1992 because they were just so non-competitive this year and it wasn't their fault at all. They just had no money. They didn't have the players and they just really should have been playing that kind of schedule. And it's also probably why I can't find any video footage of any of the games this season, because whoever was videotaping the games probably just videotaped uh, the dance troupe and the bands at the beginning and halftime and then just left when they left. So now we are flipping the calendar to 1992. We are getting over this disastrous 1991 season. And Ronald Beard actually acknowledged how bad the 1991 season was in the SWAC media guide. He realized that his team was going to go winless about halfway through the season. But even though last season was so bad, they did learn a lot about their team. For one, they learned who were their best players. As on defense, their best players were obviously their linebacker, Alphonse Provo, and their free safety, Dominic Artis as they had a total of 184 tackles and were third and fourth in the SWAC in 1991. Along with those returning players, they were also returning their best offensive player at Gillard, who was playing receiver this year, and he would be a huge help since this team pretty much had absolutely no running game. And it would also help because their best quarterback from last season, Danny Hall, would be back and he needed a good receiver since in 1991, he threw for 21 interceptions and four touchdowns. Along with these good players coming back, Prairie View A&M would bring back a total of 32 players from the previous year and 17 starters from last year too. 
So with those returning players, that should help out the team. So did the addition of some more assistant coaches. Last year they had four, and most of them were doing two or three other jobs on campus. But this year they would have six assistants. They would have a full-time offensive and defensive coordinator, as well as coaches at linebacker, DB, quarterback and running back, and wide receiver coach. So this would take something off the plate of their winless coach, Ronald Beard, who was still coaching another team on campus, as well as assisting the athletic department. So even with all those returning players, additional players that they would get either from high school or, or from on campus, and extra coaches, this team was still not competitive with pretty much anyone in 1992. And we'll start with their first four games in which they scored six points. But that wasn't the worst part, as they would give up a total of 164 points. They would play SWAC foe Texas Southern first, as they always do. And I actually found some video of this, so let's check out a little bit of it. And I'm actually going to be playing this in the background of other games I go over, so just enjoy it. And this game also had something else cool in it, and that was Michael Strahan was playing for Texas Southern in this game. He's actually number 75, but Texas Southern didn't let Prairie View do anything in this game, as they were up 20 to nothing at half, and this game was over 35 to nothing. So enjoy some more video footage as we get to Prairie View as they play two more out-of-conference foes. First was Angelo State. They were 6-3-1 last year, and you remember Angelo State shut out Prairie View last year. And Angelo State were undefeated coming into this game, and Prairie View did a little better than they did last year as they actually managed to score a field goal in this game. They still lost, though, 33-3, so their record was 0-2 now. Langston was up next, and they were also 0-2, and they were also coming into this game only scoring 14 points in their previous losses. Langston was happy to play Prairie View because they put up 33 points and over 480 total yards. Meanwhile, their defense gave up 160 total yards to Prairie View, and they didn't get in the end zone at all. This gave Prairie View their second shutout and Langston's only shutout they would have all season. So Prairie View would continue to make Division II and Division III schools look a lot better. Prairie View were now 3-0, and their streak was at 16 straight losses. Grambling and Eddie Robinson were up next, and he once again didn't hold back on Prairie View this year. Robinson and the Tigers only put up 63 points in this game as they beat down Prairie View 63-3. This next game was one of two big games this season as they played out-of-conference team West Texas A&M, and they shared something with them, that being that they were both rebuilding their football squads. West Texas was doing that because their president would abolish the sport after the 1990 season, only to bring it back in late 1991. But he would bring it back as an independent school. They left the Lone Star Conference, and they played without scholarships, so they were pretty much the same team as Prairie View were. This was looking like the game for them to win, since Prairie View actually had more returning players, and most would think that Prairie View would have better players, since they were playing Division I AA, and West Texas A&M was basically a Division III team, and they were also playing Division II and Division III teams at the time. Unfortunately, I don't have any stats on this game, but this game was really close until a 94-yard kickoff return by a West Texas A&M player who actually transferred from Prairie View A&M. And after the kickoff return, Prairie View couldn't come back and they lost 21 to 15. After that loss, it didn't get much better for them as they would play Alcorn State and Steve Air McNair. McNair was in his sophomore year and, and he was coming off of throwing 24 touchdown passes in his freshman season and he was lighting up teams again this year. Prairie View's defense couldn't stop anything Alcorn did and Alcorn only played McNair for two and a half quarters, but he would still have 220 passing yards and four touchdowns and this game was a disaster for Prairie View and their defense like last season was. They lost this game 63 to nothing. So Prairie View is 0-6 and more than halfway through this season, so that was good. They would play Alabama State, who put up 90 plus points last year on them. And this year, the Prairie View defense actually stood up to them as they only gave up half of what they did last year as they lost 44-6. to But this would start a three-game run where they would actually score a touchdown 
so that was actually something positive for Prairie View A&M this season. Mississippi Valley State was up next, and, and they lost a little bit of their seven-win team from 1991, so this game was a little closer than most thought it would be. Prairie View would actually score twice in this game, but unfortunately, Mississippi Valley would score four more times in the first half and pull away to win 35-14. So Prairie View are now 0-8 with 21 straight losses, and I'll go over Jackson State and Texas State quickly. Texas State was first, and it was an out-of-conference game, and even though Prairie View would score a touchdown, they couldn't get anything more, which didn't help since Texas State would score 56 points, giving them loss number 9 on the season. Jackson State was next, and they were mad coming into this game as they lost their last two weeks in a row, which ruined their chances for a SWAC title. Jackson State, though, had nothing to prove against Prairie View, and they shut them out 46 to nothing, giving them their 10th loss on their season and their 23rd of this streak. The season was almost over as they had one more game for Southern on November 21st. The game was happening at the University of Houston, and Prairie View was playing like it was their last game ever, as they actually held a lead. They were up 7 to nothing before a weather delay and a wind advisory delayed this game for an hour. When it resumed, Southern got back into it, but Prairie View didn't, as Southern would score but miss on the extra point, so Prairie View was still leading 7-6 to six with minutes left. This was their only fourth quarter lead and their only second half lead since the decade started. This was their only fourth quarter lead and only second half lead for Prairie View since the decade started. Southern were drive to the two yard line, but Prairie View stood them up three times and unfortunately on fourth and two Southern got in the end zone to give them the 12 to seven lead and that would hold on to give Prairie View their 11th crushing loss of the season and their 24th straight loss of this streak. Prairie View ended the season scoring 55 points or five points per game. Along with that, they only scored five offensive touchdowns. I do have some stats for this season, and their best player was, of course, Bo Gillard for the second straight year. He had 49 catches this year, but he also had 789 receiving yards. Both were down from the previous season, but that might be good because Gillard was pretty much the entire receiving core the previous season, and this year he did have some help as there were some other Prairie View receivers, and totaling they had 50 catches for over 450 yards. Also in the 1992 season, they managed to throw for over 1,200 yards between two quarterbacks, and they also improved on their rushing attack as they got 1,000 yards total, but they lost 400 yards on sacks and whatnot, so they actually had 640 net rushing yards, a 150-yard improvement from the previous season. Meanwhile, the school on defense improved a bit, which was pretty easy to do because they only gave up 441 points, a 150-point improvement over the 1991 season, and they would only just barely give up 40 points per game, and they gave up 40 points five times, which was also a five-game improvement from the previous year. Their defense improved in yards given up per game, as they gave up 471 yards per game. I know that sounds bad, but that was a 50-yard improvement improvement from the previous year. There were also positives in the turnover department as they fumbled and got intercepted less this year, which might also account for their decrease in their defensive point per game. But like I mentioned at the end of the 1991 season, they clearly weren't ready to play football because they really had no players with any experience on the 1991 roster as three quarters of the players that played in the 1991 season had little or no football experience. And in 1992, more than half of their roster had football experience coming in or playing. This can be seen in a stat that was according to Coach Beard, Prairie View started the season with 98 players and they finished with 67, which was almost double last year, and they probably could have finished with more, but some players were urged to leave the team by the coaches for their own safety. 
We are now in year three, and Ronald Beard would be coming back in 1993, and he would be trying to finally score that win for the only sport on the Prairie View campus that still hasn't won a game since the sports program came back in 1991. Even the Prairie View men's basketball team, which went on a very long losing streak as well, losing their entire first season, they actually won a game last season. So again, they were the only team on campus that still didn't win. And just a heads up, the men's basketball team actually beat a Division II basketball team for their only win, but all the fans of Prairie View were just looking for everyone to finally get a win. But let's see who's coming back for them. They would be getting their best defensive player in junior linebacker Alphonse Provo, who had 94 tackles and six sacks in 1992. On offense, they would have a few old linemen back, and they would all average 6'3 and 275 pounds, so it was looking like a normal offensive line for the Division I AA ranks. Unfortunately, though, Prairie View A&M wouldn't have back Bo Gillard, who signed with New England Patriots in the offseason, so their best wide receiver coming back only had 19 catches in his entire career. Along with Gillard not coming back, their best quarterback, Andre Reiser, also was not on the roster for the 1993 season. So that was just a sample of who was not coming back for Prairie View. But who is coming back for Prairie View? They were actually getting their largest returning class as 29 lettermen from last year were coming back to play this season, which was almost double the previous season. So just a heads up, before I start the season, it was hard to find game by game stats for this season, but I do have enough detail for the few important games this season. So I will get to those and explain to those in detail when we get to them. Started the season as they always do in the Labor Day Classic against Texas Southern. They didn't have Michael Strahan anymore this year, but that didn't stop them from beating Prairie View by 30 points, 38 to 30, to give them loss number one. Next up was out of conference opponent and D2 school Langston, and they did better than they did against them last year as they would score a touchdown in this game, but Langston would score a lot more, winning 45 to eight. In Game 3, Southern would play Prairie View and they were bringing in a new coach and a better offense, which would make this game the opposite of their 1992 contest. As Southern ran away with this game 46-6, they would get a lot better and they would end up winning the SWAC title in a couple of years. Grambling was up next and Eddie Robinson's team never held back on Prairie View, even though most in the stands knew that this game was going to be a blowout. 40,000 people showed up to watch this game, really though they showed up for the bands at halftime. The football play wasn't great, especially from Prairie View, as they got shut out again against Grambling, 49 to nothing, and quickly Prairie View was 0-4. Okay, so I went through those first four games quickly because these next two games are versus infamous teams. First, they played West Texas A&M, who already had a win this season and were on their way to becoming a reputable D2 football program. This year's game was not as close as last year's game, as West Texas A&M jumped on them early and nearly shut them out, if not for a late score by Prairie View, to make the final 28-6. Prairie View A&M was 0-5, and they would now play 4-1 Alcorn State with junior Steve McNair, who was gaining way more attention this year, not only due to his stats, but also due to Alcorn State games all coming down to the wire. Four out of their first five games this season for Alcorn ended within three points, and four had wins all come down the wire due to McNair's running or passing them to victory at the end of the game. However, Alcorn didn't even need McNair to do any of those last-minute heroics, as he threw for a couple of touchdown passes, and Prairie View was never really in this game as they lost again 31-10. Enjoy some more McNair highlights as I go over these next few games because they got smashed by SWAC teams like Alabama State and Mississippi Valley State 37-6 and 42-6 respectively. Both of these teams finished at or below 500. They all sat their starters in the second half, which allowed Prairie View to score either in the second half or near the second half. But Prairie View is now 0-8, and they would have an interesting opponent up next in the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, who are an NAIA team, so about three steps lower than Division I AA. But UAPB was interesting because they were playing football for the first time since 1990. 
The reason for this was because of a massive investigation by the NAIA that found the previous coaching staff using numerous fifth and sixth year players under pseudonyms. The investigation really started on three or four cases, but it wound up totaling 123, which was huge. The NAIA used to revoke school's memberships because of massive violations like this, but instead they were given the death penalty as the school acknowledged their issue and cleaned up the program quickly. By the way, I've gone over the death penalty in a previous video, I'll link that above. So Pine Bluff didn't have an athletic program for the entire 1991 season. Pine Bluff's team would return in 1992, but they didn't play and instead used the year to recruit and got ready for 1993. And they were more ready than Prairie View were because UAPB already had four wins this season. The wins were over D2, D3, and NAIA schools, but still, they had four wins. Also, Pine Bluff did play Mississippi Valley State and Grambling and lost to them by two touchdowns or more in each of those games. So because of that, some of the people on the Prairie View campus were thinking maybe they could actually beat Pine Bluff since Pine Bluff did lose to some SWAC schools and some people were still thinking that Prairie View were on the same level as SWAC teams. Now I don't have any stats on this game and I wish I could actually watch this game because it was actually a really close game. UAPB could only score 12 points and Prairie View would end up getting in the end zone but with only two seconds left and they would end up going for two and got it. Unfortunately though that's all they could get and they lost 12 to 8. The streak is now at 33 straight losses and the opportunity to get a win were slim to none in these last two games. They played Jackson State in Game 10, who clobbered them 37-7 to close out another SWAC season winless. In their final game, they played Division I AA Independent School, UAB, who just started their program in 1991 and in their first year of playing D1 AA schools. UAB were already 8-2 and, and they smashed a few SWAC schools already this year and they did the same to Prairie View as they had over 500 yards of offense in this game. They actually had a receiver who had over 150 yards receiving in this game alone to win 58-12 but Prairie View did score 12 points in this game so I guess that's pretty good for them. Gave Prairie View A&M another winless season and now they had 35 straight losses to end this season. This season though they did improve point wise on offense as they had 77 points. They were only shut out once but I'm pretty sure most of these points came in the second half when they were already playing backups. I don't have player stats this season but there usually isn't much when I actually find some. On defense, they gave up 423 points, a slight improvement from last year, and also this year, they didn't give up crazy scores like they did in previous years, as in their final game versus UAB, that was the most points they gave up all season, 58. And even though they didn't give up 60 or 90 points in a game, they consistently gave up 30 plus points, as they did that in 9 games in the 1993 season. It's now 1994, Ronald Beard is now in year 4, he is still without scholarships, and he has worked through the challenges, and is getting the team better and better every year. Along with that, he is also retaining players every year, which also helps to improve the team. One of those players that has gone all four years with Beard is senior linebacker Alphonse Provo. He would be the star of the defense and lead in all categories, and he also got double teamed in most games. This would normally help other players step up, but as you would hear, that really didn't happen again this year. On the offensive side of the ball, they increased their output over the last three years, but this year, they would be starting with a lot of new talent and a lot of freshman talent. They would use two freshmen at QB this year, as well as at least three on their offensive line. This can usually benefit the team in year three or four, but these freshmen weren't scholarship athletes, so this was a team that was mostly walk-on freshmen. And if you wanted them to get better, you would have to hope that they could make it to junior and senior year. With knowing that, let's start 1994. They started it with the Labor Day Classic versus Texas Southern. Prairie View A&M actually looked good all game and hung around all game. It was only 14 to seven at half. And after half, whoever stayed enjoyed a pretty tough second half where Prairie View actually got within a touchdown, but they couldn't come any closer, losing 20 to 13 and getting loss number 36. 
After that first game, it was looking like maybe they had turned the corner after 4 years, but then they played UA Pine Bluff, who were even better this year than they were last year, and they were able to get a full recruiting class this year as well. UA Pine Bluff crushed them early, and it wasn't even a game, as Pine Bluff easily won 51 to nothing. Langston was up next, and they were getting better and better every time Prairie View played them. They would actually win their conference this year, and Langston would dominate again this year, beating Prairie View 36-10. The game was actually not really as close as you would think. Game 4 was where the season crashed around them as they played Grambling in the Cotton Bowl. 66,000 people showed up to the game, but a lot of them came to see the bands and also to go to the state fair outside the stadium. But most of the people who bought tickets weren't really interested in the game as much as halftime when the Battle of the Bands came around. And you know what, they pretty much had every right to because this game was a complete blowout again, as Grambling would shut out Prairie View again 66 to nothing. Prairie View was now 0-4 and they had two shutouts already in this season. But that didn't get them down as they played Southern next and they played Southern really tough, at least for the first half. Prairie View had a 7-6 lead at half, which was really rare, but don't worry, it didn't last long because Southern would shut them out in the second half, 15-0, to win this game 21-6. With that last loss, Prairie View now hit number 40, and they would welcome Air McNair and Alcorn State to Prairie View next. By this point, McNair already had 2,000 passing yards, and he would use Prairie View to increase his stats even more. In this game, McNair was responsible for eight total touchdowns. He would pass for five touchdowns and run for three, as Alcorn easily won 69-14. Prairie View did have 180 rushing yards, but they only had 12 passing yards, which was awful, and especially awful since Alcorn State had the second worst defense in the SWAC, just barely ahead of Prairie View. So it wasn't really a big deal to score on Alcorn State, that was the reason why McNair had to always throw for at least five touchdowns every game. But enjoy some more McNair highlights as Prairie View stayed home to play Alabama State, who put up 54 points on them, but Prairie View again managed to get double digits, losing 54-13. Prairie View is now 0-7, but they would play Mississippi Valley State, who are in the bottom of the swack this year. This game was really the last chance they had to get a win this season, as they stayed close for the first half, but then they ran out of steam in the second half, and they lost 21-10. Prairie View A&M stepped down in competition in their next game as they played Tarleton State, who were making the transition from NAIA to Division II. This was the yearly game that they scheduled from a team in a lower level to try to get a win. This year's game wasn't really a step down for Prairie View. It was a step down for Tarleton, I guess, since they crushed them by 50 points, winning 70-20. to Prairie View had their final SWAC game next as they played Jackson State. And this game was not close at all, as Jackson State was awesome this year, and they gave nothing to Prairie View, beating them 52-7 to give Prairie View their fourth straight winless SWAC campaign. This loss also gave them their 40 fifth straight loss, officially giving them the longest losing streak in Division I college football, going past Columbia's 44-game losing streak. I'll put the link above that because I did a two-parter on that. In their final game, they had UAB for the second year in a row, and they were in their fourth year of their program, and they played a full 1AA schedule as well as playing Big 12 team Kansas. UAB was 6-4 and, and on a four-game winning streak. Prairie View was just looking to get through this game and end this season, and by the final score, that's what happened, as it was 48-6. Which means they gave up six less points this year than they did last year, so that's at least a positive. But with that loss, they were 0-11 to end the season again, and the streak was at 46 to end the first half of this decade. We do have stats on this season, and obviously Prairie View finished last as a team in pretty much every category, except for rushing offense, they were second to last, penalties, they were third, and on offense, they did score 100 points. That was the first time they did that since the 1988 season. They averaged just a shade over nine points, and they did average 209 yards per game. Their rushing offense, which finished second to last in the SWAC, 
had 1,252 yards, or just over 110 yards per game rushing. On defense, Provo led in sacks, tackles, and tackles for loss, and his only real help was Gerald Crowder, who had seven interceptions and ran two back for touchdowns over the last two years. But even with them on their defense, they gave up 508 points. This was higher than their previous two years, and they were averaging giving up 46.2 points per game, which was 13 points more than the next team in the SWAC. Prairie View would also average giving up 474 yards per game, and they gave up 200 yards in rushing and passing average per game. But even with all that, Ronald Beard was pretty confident that his team could improve next year, and since he had a lot of freshmen and sophomore playing this year that were coming back, Coach Beard was also looking towards the future because he knew he would get some help with scholarships finally coming for 1996. But I'm not going to end this part yet because there was some really big news which affects part two that happened during this season. In October, Prairie View a and welcomed a new president in Charles A. Hines. He was coming in to help Prairie View get back to being a great school as their budget was starting to get steady after years of decline. President Hines would start to improve other things on campus, which took his attention away from athletics. But starting in the spring and summer of 1995, he would start to make some changes. And I'll get to those changes in my next video because they were some real big changes. But thank you so much for hanging out with me on this very long journey. We are only halfway through, but we will get through the rest of the Prairie View A&M epic eight year long losing streak. And yeah, we're only in 1995, so stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, please. Like this video, please. Share this video. Get other people to subscribe to my channel, please. Uh, leave a comment on this video. Tell me uh, other teams you think I should be covering. And as always, make sure you follow me on Twitter at SportsWrongs. Have a great day and stay tuned because I will be having part two coming up next week.